Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Shri Ayer. Today I have a new guest. He is actually an author. He is also a PhD. Dr. Arun Krishnan. Dr. Arun Krishnan has studied and lived in different cities across India, USA, Singapore, and Japan before putting down roots in Bengaluru. He started off with a degree in engineering and a doctorate, and went on to work in IT, high-performance computing, bioinformatics. computational biology and hr analytics he has worked at various corporations research institutes and also in academia as an assistant professor of computational biology and then just to shake things up arun went for an mba and turned entrepreneur he is a polyglot and is conversant in tamil english hindi bengali japanese and kannada he loves to sing and play the guitar keyboard and percussion instruments he's also an amateur historian and enjoys visiting historical places while he has over 50 articles in journals congress conferences and book chapters this is his first book of fiction what is this book i'm going to introduce the name of the book also but first let's welcome our guest dr arun krishnan dr krishnan namaskaram and welcome to p guru's channel Namaskaram, Sri. Thank you so much, and please call me Arun. Uh, we'll, we'll do Arun. Uh, see, I have already switched. So, um, Arun, I'm just going to introduce our viewers to the book that you've written. This is your first book, The Battle for Vatapi, Nandi's Charge, and I'm going to put it up now on the screen, and, and viewers, you can see it. This book is available on Amazon, and this is. I just read the extract. I have not. yet read the book but this is also something that is very close to my heart uh, and and the, the fact that you know there was a, a battle for ascendancy in the southern uh, part of india how various kingdoms chalukyas pallavas pandyas choras and cheras and so on and so forth so now first uh, let's hear a little bit about uh, dr arun krishnan's life journey and then perhaps we can dwell into his book and i'll yield the floor to you Please tell so, us where where did your journey begin? Go ahead. Um, so I I've lived uh, in a lot of different places in India. Um, my father had a transferable job, so I grew up mostly in the eastern part of India, in in Orissa and Bengal. Uh, went to boarding school, uh, then did my uh, undergrad in India. Uh, came to the US in '94 to do my PhD. Um, lived in south carolina and then baltimore we worked in the us for a year uh, came back to india then went to singapore from singapore went to japan and then returned finally um so lived in quite a few places uh, i do enjoy traveling have traveled a lot uh, so yeah that's in short uh, you know how my life's gone and i've been in bangalore i think i should consider myself a bangalorean now been here since uh, 2008 so that's almost 14 years um uh, arun this is a fascinating topic like i said before and before we start jumping into the book itself i want to set the stage for some of our viewers viewers there is a fantastic author in tamil called kalki krishnamurthy and he used to run his own magazine in tamil called kalki and it, this was one of the most sought after uh magazines that used to come i think uh, i think it is still there i i could be wrong about this uh arun can tell me if it is right or wrong but he is known for his works on uh, historical uh, depictions of what happened in the pallava dynasties you know many of us go to chennai we also go to mahabalipuram but at that point of time you know our interest starts waning if you really really want to understand how much pallavas uh, thrived what kind of uh, trade they had because they predate the choras like the rajaraja chora and others so this so in fact what you see today of mahabalipuram is only i think a quarter the rest of it is submerged in the sea so that means this pallavas probably go way back so anyway so the question for you uh, arun is that there are you know seminal works of uh, kalki one thing that comes to my mind is parthiban kanavu and uh, tell me 
the book that you've written, it's a fictional account, of course. And uh, how much of it mirrors what was written in Kalki's Parthiban Kanavu? These are for our Tamil readers who have read Kalki's work. If not, at least for the rest of the world, remember that we are talking about a fictional story that is set perhaps in the 7th century AD. And, and Arun will walk us through what is the story about and why we should all be reading this. Go ahead, Arun. So uh, thanks, Sri. So thanks for bringing up the great Kalki, by the way. Um, so he has been, um, you know, my my uh, interest in historical fiction obviously predates Kalki. Um, I, you know, we grew up reading, you know, Victor Hugo, Alexander Duma, and so on. But uh, historical fiction, and especially Indian historical fiction, my interest in that stems from my reading of Kalki. I came to Kalki rather late. Uh, because, like I said, I grew up in the north and the east, and I was never formally taught Tamil. Uh, my mother had, uh, you know, taught me the script when I was younger, and then um, I wanted to read Kalki's uh, Sivagami, a uh, in Selvan, uh, in the original Tamil. So I just picked up the book, the first volume of Ponniin Selvan. As you know, it's five huge volumes, almost a thousand five hundred pages. Um, I picked up the book, uh, started reading. It took me like a whole year to read the first volume because in every page I would have a, a Tamil English dictionary next to me, look up words. Uh, it took me a long time, but then my reading speed improved um, and I kind of went through the other four volumes within, I think, the next year. Um, the one that I think you're mentioning is actually Sivagami in Sabadam because that deals with the Pallava Chalukya conflict. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's it's a, it's an amazing. In fact, I prefer I I think or my favorite among Kalki's uh, historical fictions is actually Sivagami in Sabadam, uh, rather than Purni in Selvan. Um, I think it's a great it's a great book, and uh, except for the fact that the setting is the same, that is the period and the two protagonists in this case, the Pallavas uh, and the Chalukyas. Um, the treatment I have given done in the book is very, very different. So if you've read Sivagami in Sabadam and you expect to see something very like Sivagami in Sabadam, this is not it because it takes, uh, I've tried to take a, a slightly more modern take on it. Um, and uh, the only, my, my hat tip to the great uh, Kalki is uh, that I've named one character as Naganandi, who was this, you know, this brilliant character in Sivagami in Sabadam. So that's, uh, I think that's about the only thing that would be in common between Sivagami in Sabadam and uh, Nandi's Charge or the Battle of Vata PC. Arun just shows you how much or how little I know about Kalki's works. You know, I have read parts of the book, uh, Sivagami in Sabadam, but I didn't do justice. Uh, like you, I've also learned it by just uh, adding letters. And uh, my mom used to uh, read all this Kumudam Kalkandri. With, and, and that's how my curiosity in Tamil started. Now I've become fairly decent. I can even write. But it's all self self taught. I grew up in Hyderabad, like you. You you grew up in the eastern part of India. Now, see, all these things need a trigger. I mean, why seventh century? What made you choose this period as your setting for your fictional novel? Um, can you share some thoughts on this? Because I'm just trying. I'm curious how we're all becoming authors. I mean, we both have very similar backgrounds. I was an engineer. Uh, and uh, I, I've done a few startups, and now my latest startup is, of course, P Gurus. P Gurus is more of a social experiment, if you will. Uh, we've been doing a lot of things. I'm not afraid to kind of jump into the deep end of the pool, and <laughs> I learn swimming after that. But that's that's a, a, a topic for a different day. Um, how did this all start? Where did the spark go off that you wanted to write about uh, this period, a fictional book? See. Um... I'll tell you. So I, my father's side hailed from uh, Tanjavur, okay. Hmm. And every every time we used to go there, we used to uh, go to the big temple, the Periya Koil, right? Brihadishwara. Right, right. Brihadishwara temple. And yeah. yeah, and I, I was, I was just mesmerized. I, I even now I'm mesmerized by that temple. Every time I, we, the last time I went was in December. I go there, and it's almost like, um, no, I'm I'm not a religious person, but it's almost like a, I, I feel like I've been there before. Right, you get that sense. Uh, I, I think about you know what the great Raja Raja must have walked these very steps. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a it's I can't explain it, 
it's an inexplicable feeling that i get when i go there as if the place comes alive in in all its hoary past and its traditions um so i i knew when i used to go there maybe 15 you know if even yeah, earlier i used to think you know what uh, in in uh, the periya kovil there is on on one side to the left there is a nandi there right and yes. that nandi is not well formed it leans to one side uh, and people say that it was abandoned because it didn't come out clearly or so on but i always used to think there is some story there if you could just weave a story around it or something uh, so i always had this idea of writing something in the historical fiction domain um probably uh, my uh, my instinct to write about the Pal- pallavas and chalukyas came about uh, i think in 2009 it was when we had my wife and i had done a, a road trip in karnataka so we had gone to hampi from there to aihole pattadakkal badami and when i saw that it just struck me that it's such a beautiful place with so many beautiful sculptures and so on and that story should be told um, and then i was conflicted about okay wh- what do i tell right should i tell about pulikeshi's rise or should i tell about his uh, you know the sacking of watapi at the end of it and i just thought there was more drama in the latter one so i said okay let me let me talk about that and that's how i settled on it the other reason is because if you if you notice most of the historical fictions or the novels that are coming up in india um, are focused on the northern part of india right yes uh, yes even Am- amish recently came up with to hail dev uh, which is you know a great king in the north and then you have the whole meluha series you have, you have a whole bunch of them all talking about either the mahabharata or the ramayana different characters but everything is centered in the north and so i kind of wanted to tell the history of the south and you know you you know we've both grown up in schools where the history taught to us is so very delhi centric right so i just wanted to talk about a time period and a region in indian history which is not well represented and which i want to expose the people of india the people of you know in, in the to the world in general you know um viewers if you look at the cover closely you will see the brihadeswara temple at the top and arun also brings to us uh, the geographic region where uh, where is watapi and and where is uh, i think that is kanchi if i am not wrong yeah that's and right. uh, also lays a dharma chakra it it's a beautifully laid out cover it should attract eyeballs and and viewers i urge you to read about south south was just as uh, patriotic just as enterprising as i must say because they knew how to uh, master the seas uh, they they were completely dependent only on wind there was no steam engine nothing of that sort there was not even a compass i might be wrong about it but i'm reasonably sure there was no compass so then you might ask the question so how did they know which direction they were sailing well there is a breed of monkeys called devang that is the today's word but it's actually deva vak that means like god speech why they call that particular species that was because it used to always sit facing the north i don't know how much you know about this part arun uh, in the seafaring things this this is how they used to uh, navigate i believe i i i don't know about the monkey actually that that's something i'm learning now um i do believe they had some sort of a compass they used to have this bowl of oil in which they would float an iron bar and magnetized bar is what i've read um now you know a lot of it is speculation as well uh but i i'll come back to your earlier point right that you yeah. tried me which is um the fact that a lot happened in the south but it's not just that when we are taught history we are taught in a very compartmentalized manner there is uh you know the north was the north and there were a lot of kingdoms that rose and fell and invasions and then the south is hardly touched upon whereas what i have shown in the book that there was a con- continuity so if you go back to that 7th century period you had uh, king harshavardhana in the north north of the narmada river you had pulikeshi in just south of that uh, pretty much across the deccan plateau uh, so you know southern maharashtra gujarat uh west what we call western madhya pradesh uh, the t- regions of telangana and andhra pradesh uh, and then you know north north to central karnataka uh, etc 
And then below that, you had the Pallavas and the Gangas and the Pandyas and Cheras. Um, the Choras were minor feudatories at that point. And you also had kings in Lanka. So the, the story actually spans from Sri Lanka, or what, what was Lanka then, all the way up north to uh, Harsha's kingdom. Because uh, the Lankan kings would intervene in Indian wars in the south. The Indian, the Tamil kings would intervene in uh, you know, wars in Lanka. One of the Lanka kings had supported Pulikeshi against Narasimha Varma Pallava's father, Mahendra Varman. And similarly, another king, his rival, Lankan king, Manavama had supported Narasimha Verma against Pulikeshi. So there was all of this tight-knit integration. Trade carried out throughout India. People were going on pilgrimages throughout India. So this notion that the South and North were very divided in their history, the way we are taught, that isn't true. And hopefully the book brings that out. Wonderful. And uh, is the book available now in ebook form as well as in a paperback or hardbound? Can yes. you give us a little bit of details about the book? Yeah, it's available both uh, on Amazon.com and Amazon.in uh, in both ebook and paperback form. And, and how long has it been in the market so far? I've seen a lot of rave reviews for it. In fact, that's how we connected. Uh, what has been the general feedback? Maybe one or two points that you can raise what people felt after reading the book? So um, the book was published or came out uh, or started shipping, I think, on December 25th. And uh, I've got very good reviews. So, you know, everybody, pretty much everybody who has read it, uh, you know, either my followers on Twitter who have done it or otherwise, uh, they've had very good, they've, one of the things that they say is it transports us back to that time and it is it's extremely gripping. So I've had one, one person said, I started it at 10, 10 p.m. at night and finished it at 6 a.m. in the morning. You know, no author uh, is, you know, that's probably one of the things that you can say that will make the author the happiest, right? That somebody actually binge read your book through the night. Uh, and that's one of the comments that, that was very close to my heart. Now, um, quick question. Did you use uh, Sanskrit or Tamil or both in the book? Uh, or was it completely written in English? No, it's completely written in English, but there are certain words that are in Tamil. Uh, mm. So, for example, Veshti or Angavastram, and I right. give footnotes as to what they are. But I thought it's better to use the original term so that, hey, why not? If people can learn Mantra and Guru, why can't they learn Veshti? Of and course, Angavastram? of course. The, 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 this is our way to contributing to the English language. English is a very open yes. language. So, in fact, I don't know how much you know. Uh, Sharut, Sharut is Surut, Surut and uh, Katamaran, Katamaran is Katamaran. Uh, Katamaran. Yes. <laughs> soup. Correct. Mulagatani <laughs> soup. So there is a lot of things. Kasa is cash. So we can we can go on. But um, uh, Arun, it was a pleasure talking to you, and I wish you all success. And viewers, we're going to put a link to the book in in our show more section of this video, and be sure to. Uh, buy it and read it. This you have to read. You can't just buy it and keep it on your shelf. It looks good on the shelf. No, it does look good on the shelf, but it also looks better if you read about it because we need to know what our history is. Our curriculum, you know, <laughs> our children are not going to get a chance to read it. I don't think the way this is going, this is like the communists and the left ecosystem has put education as their last stand, if you will. That's just my opinion. So please do read our history. There is a lot to learn from it. And, and as always, you know, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel and click on the join button. Uh, Dr. Arun Krishnan, pleasure talking to you. Namaskaram. Pleasure is all mine, Sri. Thank you so much.